Am I all set? Yes, hi. Hi, hello everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, first, I'd like to thank the SAR staff and the scholar pro program coordinators for all of their help um, and for making it possible for me to be here at SAR alongside um, a pretty phenomenal group of um, scholars and interns and artists and activists. I feel really honored to be here with this particular group of people. Um, I'd also like to thank the Weatherhead Foundation and to thank the, um, the institutions that funded my dissertation research, which I'll be talking about today, so NSF and Werner Gren, and also the Society for Psychological Anthropology. So this talk is full of very um, fresh ideas that I've been working through over the past few weeks, and I'm looking forward to sharing this all for the first time, really, with everyone here today. Um, and because this is so new and because none of this is published, I would just encourage everyone watching at home on YouTube to, um, to please cite uh, any ideas that you draw from this talk. So just a little roadmap of where we'll be going. Um, I'll begin with a very broad overview of my research, followed by a, a brief discussion of my methods, and then some ethnographic examples, and then I'll um, wrap things up with some concluding thoughts. And uh, my one last disclaimer is that I use pseudonyms um, throughout the talk for both the humans and the technologies. So, as I said, I'll be speaking about my ethnographic fieldwork, which I conducted between 2015 and 2017, which followed um, three teams of psychiatric and engineering professionals at U.S.-based universities working to develop automated listening technologies for psychiatric assessment. And they're working on technologies like cell phone applications and software packages that can be installed in user interfaces and even humanoid robots. Um, and their goal is to collaborate to tackle one of Western psychiatry's um, longest standing issues, the subjective nature of psychiatric assessment. Um, and the teams, the teams, they design their devices to draw a connection between how speech sounds in inner psychological states. So unlike Alexa or Siri, which some of you may be familiar with or even have in your homes, um, these algorithmic prototypes are supposed to be incapable of analyzing and processing what you say, and instead they only attend to, to how you say it. And um, I bring up Siri and Alexa not only as a way to explain the difference between them and the technologies that my informants are building, but also because there's something interesting going on in the way that um, Alexa and Siri are depicted in the popular media that I saw going on in my fieldwork there is a tendency to say that Alexa is listening. But Alexa is only listening in as much as she is a she. So listening is something, is something that humans do and other animals do, um, and um, if you were here from Mayanthi's talk, that spirits also do. So what does it mean to suggest or, or imply that, that a machine or a computer is listening? Is machine listening uh, a metaphor? Is it an analogy? Uh, what, what broader cultural imaginaries about what it means to be human does this notion of machine listening point to or stand for? And moreover, what does the gendering of technology mean for humans? These are some of the questions that have been guiding me as I finish my dissertation. Um, and the larger takeaway message of my dissertation um, and of this talk here today is as follows. It's, it's not very productive to think about automation as autonomous, as machines doing things with no human intervention. Instead, it's, it's much more productive and actually more accurate to think about automation as heteromation, as a mixture of human and machine work. And this is a term that Ekpia and Nardi use, and it's also the title of their 2017 book. Considering automation as heteromation, as human, humans doing things with machines, although the humans aren't so easy to find always, allows us to think through automation anthropologically and to better understand automated systems as cultural things rather than set aside from culture. It also allows us to bring the humans who play a fundamental role in automated systems back into view and to investigate why these humans are so hard to find. So, as I mentioned, my informants want their technologies to only analyze what are sometimes called nonverbal or paralinguistic components of speech. So, the, the pitch and the energy and the speed um, or the breathiness of speech. 
These are, um, as I said, the sounds of speech, the form of speech rather than the, the content. So um, in this picture, the engineer is listening to an excerpt of speech, but at the same time, he's looking at a spectrogram, which is a visualization of um, the frequency of sound over time. And um, the engineers, like this guy here, they bring to the teams a paradigm for analyzing speech that flattens speech into a signal with physical acoustic properties. And the psychiatrists call upon these techniques, the engineers' techniques, for analyzing speech and argue that treating speech in this way as a sound, as a signal, allows them to identify connections between the physical properties of speech sounds and the changes in the brain that occur with mental illness. So, to explain this another way, if you take as your starting point um, mental illness to be an essentially neurobiological problem, then the onset of mental illness corresponds with changes in the brain. And the brain also controls the coordination, the coordination of the muscles, like the ones I'm using now, um, that produce the sounds of speech, so that the tongue and the, the larynx and the mouth, so that the coordination of these muscles controls and impacts how the speech sounds. So with these things being the case, you can use speech sounds as signs of biological changes that occur with the onset of mental illness, signs that indicate the pathological state of a speaker's brain. There is a sense among the researchers that these signs are more objective because they're anchored in the body and also because they circulate outside of um, human sociocultural meaning. They're occurring at the spectral level of sound, which means that they're so minute that humans can't really hear them. And if they can hear them, they won't register as meaningful, even if you're an incredibly skilled, experienced clinician. And this is where artificial intelligence, or AI, is supposed to be helpful, with the engineers reasoning, well, we can design a pattern recognition system, an algorithm, to systematically and to only attend to these things that humans might never attend to. Now, this way of listening to speech departs pretty radically from the standard way of listen listening to speech in psychiatric settings. So typically, when a mental health care um, professional assesses someone's psychiatric state in order to determine if they're ill, they ask the potential patient a series of questions about their state of being, or the speaker themselves reports their own, their own symptoms. And as the patient answers, the person assessing them pays attention to the meaning of what they're saying. The way that speech is treated this way um, in psychiatric encounters corresponds with ideas about language that linguistic anthropologists have shown is pretty specific to Euro-American communities of speakers. So this notion that speech's primary function is referential to refer to things in the world and the notion that speech can convey and carry forth the inner state of a speaker in a way that the speaker can agentively control. This is all to say that in conventional psychiatric interactions in the US, the focus is on the content of the speech due to the belief that the semantic content is connected to a speaker's inner state. In fact, the whole enterprise of Western psychiatry itself is arrested at the level of language and semantic meaning. There are no blood tests for depression, they're only conversations. Um, and this is precisely what my informants are trying to intervene on and precisely why the lead psychiatrists on the teams turn to the expertise of the engineers. And I should say, just as a side note, they're only trying to automate um, assessment, not diagnosis and treatment. And this is a very crucial point that I'll circle back to later. So, to summarize, the engineering team members have very specific ideas about how language works. Um, what Judith Irvine and Bambi Shefflin and others, other linguistic anthropologists, call language ideologies. And given those ideologies, the engineers also have very specific ideas about how and which components of language should be listened to. And the engineers' language ideologies differ very significantly from the ideologies conventional to psychiatry. So let me walk you through what all this looks like using um, an example from one of my field sites. So I'm sitting in a large sunlit office at West Coast University, a few feet away from the cubicle I've been assigned to. And I'm meeting with Klaus, the primary investigator of the engineering team. I've come to the university to work as a research assistant in order to get a behind the scene look at a technology that a federal agency contacted Klaus and his colleagues in the psychology department to build. 
called the Virtual Human Interviewer, or the VHI. The agency funding this project wanted team members um, um, on the members of the engineering and the psychology department to work together to create an intervention for the high incidence of veteran and soldier suicide and the underreporting of mental health issues. The agency propositioned Klaus and his colleagues to build a system that could tirelessly and systematically identify the nonverbal signals of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, that soldiers inadvertently convey as they answer a set of interview questions drawn from a combination of different psychiatric assessment questionnaires. The VHI has two components. First, there's the, the software, which Klaus and, and the engineering team built, um, which I call VirtuSense. And then there's the, the user interface, which the psychology team built. Um, to be interviewed by the VHI, subjects are hooked up to a microphone, and they sit in front of a large screen and a small webcam. And on the screen is an animated character, an adult woman with olive skin and dark brown hair, who the researchers have named Abby. Abby appears to ask the research subjects interview questions. Um, to better explain this, um, the psychology team has tried to create this experience where the research subjects are interviewed by Abby. Um, so Abby asks questions, and then you answer, and then as you answer, Abby nods her head along or leans forward to encourage a sense of rapport and also to urge the subject to keep on talking. Klaus tells me that he has set up this meeting so that I can get to know the VHI data as soon as possible. I'd been expecting us to examine lines of code together, so I'm startled when he pulls up an archive video of a research subject's interview. This is when I realize that the 300 or so video recorded interviews are the VHI data. Or to be more precise, the research subject's speech is the data, the fundamental building blocks of the whole system. Like many of WCU's um, West Coast University's research subject, the subject is a veteran, recruited from either Craigslist or the local Veterans Association, the VA. The interview begins with Abby, the animated character, asking lighthearted questions about the veteran's favorite place to travel. And gradually, the questions creep into darker territory, like, what's a memory that you wish you could erase from your mind? The contents of the veterans' answers, answers grow graphic to the point that I'm uncomfortable to be listening alongside Klaus. But Klaus is not listening to the content. He wants me to guess if the computer, VirtuSense, the software, assess the veteran as showing signs of PTSD, depression, or neither. He tries to direct my ears to the kinds of things that the software is supposed to pick up on. Listen to the breathiness of her voice, he urges me, or how she slurs her words a little. I guess that she's showing signs of depression, but Klaus tells me that I'm incorrect. And he plays the interview again, but still I can't hear the, the breathiness or the slurs. And what I also can't see is that there are other people present in the video, people who I wouldn't learn about until much later on in my fieldwork. Two younger female members of the psychology team who had watched and listened to the veteran's interview from another room monitoring the content of her speech for any mentions of suicide or homicide in a way that VirtuSense couldn't, because the system is de not designed to analyze content and therefore it can't pick up on the particular semantic nuances of suicidal speech. For legal liability reasons and for the sake of the well-being of the research subjects and because the VHI did such a good job of not attending to content, there always had to be humans in the loop. This first encounter with Klaus and the VHI brings to mind the voight kampf test of Philip K. Dick's science fictional novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, depicted in the 1982 film Blade Runner. In a post-apocalyptic post future, where androids and humans coexist and are indistinguishable from one another, the voight kampf test is supposed to help bounty hunters sort out the humans from the machines. Like the VHI, when the suspected android answers a series of interview questions, the voight kampf apparatus focuses in on minute, unconscious bodily reflexes that reveal the speaker's inner state, irrespective of the content of their answers. I think it's telling that the 2017 sequel to Blade Runner reimagines the voight kampf test as a test for PTSD that seeks out signals of emotional trauma in the voice. <clears throat> 
This speaks to the cultural pervasiveness of the idea that emotions and psychic pain are contained in the voice, are unconsciously expressed, and can be made knowable by listening, but must be listened to in a certain way with the aid of technological intervention. This is the same occult cultural imaginary of the polygraph. The device supposedly unlocks the secrets of emotions by translating the body signs into a more material trace. Despite these familiar resonances with the voight kampf test, my meeting with Klaus was, and his attempt to get me to guess the VHI assessment was not so much a test as it was a demonstration. A demonstration that I am human and that there are limits to what I can hear. He provided a simulation of what the software listened for by showing how out of reach these signs were to me. This is also an enactment of why the VHI is necessary. I was focused on the content, while the software could focus on things that had nothing to do with the content. But in addition to demonstrating the power and the necessity of the system, Klaus's story also performed a kind of sleight of hand, a disappearing trick. His demonstration left out the role of the young women who monitored the subjects from a hidden room, and whose responsibility it was to listen to the content of, the spe of speech in the way that the system ignored. They were also responsible for explaining the study to the research subjects and securing this, the subjects' consent and then debriefing them after the interview. In the very early stages of the research, it was their job to interview the subjects face-to-face -face and then transcribe and code the interviews, um, outlining the basic interactional infrastructure that would be built into Abby, the user interface. In later stages, as the psychology team was trying to develop the question that Abby asks and trying to figure out what Abby's animation should look like, what her body language should look like, these two, women actually, these two young women, they actually um, controlled the bodily movements and the timing of Abby's question. Um, so this is just an example of what the interface would look like, but they'd be watching the research subject, which is me there, um, on one side, and then the, the Abby on the other side, and then in the middle, they have this interface where they can press buttons on the keyboard and then control the bodily movements and then the questions. And one woman was the body and the other woman was the, was the voice. So neither of these young women had extensive clinical training. One was actually still an undergraduate at the time of the study. Nevertheless, they played a fundamental role in making sure that the rest of the team, especially those on the engineering side, got the data that they needed by managing the comfort of the research subjects, the data source, and by managing the extraction of that data, the answers to the interview questions. At my other field sites, I also came to find that researchers with the least amount of training in engineering or researchers on the psychology side of things played a similar um, emotionally charged or even custodial role, um, responsible for labor that revolved around language practices like interviewing or trying to establish trust and rapport. Um, and labor that re revolved around the same kind of listening I couldn't stop myself from doing in the room with Klaus and the same kind of listening that um, someone conducting psychiatric assessment usually engages in, listening for the meaning of speech. In other words, I encountered a paradox at the center of my informant's efforts. In order to design a machine that can listen to mental illness beyond the human, you need and have to rely on humans listening. Because the data they needed to build their prototypes of speech, especially highly emotional speech, you need, as I said, research members um, extracting that data, making sure that the extraction process isn't psychologically harmful to the research subjects. And then you need researchers categorizing the data and making judgments about it. The researchers doing this listening, the extracting and categorizing the data, tended to be women, especially women on the psychology side of the teams. And their listening tended to involve a good deal of what Arlie Russell Hochschild has termed emotional labor, managing your, your own emotions or someone else's emotions for the sake of doing your job, which is work that involves what are sometimes called soft skills, so skills that are stereotypically feminized and are focused on feelings or the maintenance of social bonds rather than rationality or reason. This mode of listening differed significantly from the mode of listening that the engineering the engineering team was trying to make possible, which was a kind of objective listening, um, an ear from nowhere that was supposed to ignore speech's relationship 
to personal meaning altogether and treat it as a depersonalized biological sign. Now, research subjects knew that Abby wasn't human. Um, the point of the study was to convince the subject that there was no human at all listening to them in order to prove that people are more emotionally honest when they don't think that they're being judged. And moreover, Klaus knew that the young women were there, and I'm, I'm not trying to imply that he was trying to hide them from me. I, I think that he simply didn't find their presence noteworthy because they weren't a part of the VHI data or part of his definition of the VHI software. They weren't members of his team. They were um, on the psychology team, which was responsible for building the user interface, which was outside of Klaus's research interests, quite frankly. Um, Klaus and other researchers were also extremely aware of the paradox at the center of their projects that machine listening is human listening because they know that AI relies on human judgment or because they were the ones delegating the tasks to the other um, members of the research teams. With this being the case, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm not going to be evaluating the technologies. Do they work? Don't they work? Um, could they work better? This is really my informant's jobs. Um, they're very aware of their own shortcomings, um, and their lives and careers really um, revolve around trying to make up for the shortcomings. Instead, instead of looking at the technologies then, I'm going to take an approach that is classic to um, science and technology studies, to look through the technologies, to open them up and ask, how did they come together? Um, what, what are the conditions of their possibility? And who makes them work? What is the, um, the organizational hierarchy within the teams? And what the, does the division of labor look like? Especially along disciplinary lines, but also in terms of gender. If machine listening always requires human listening, then who are the hidden figures here whose labor gets elided? Um, so one thing that my ethnography, I think, affirms or illustrates is something that uh, Lily Arani has recently said, which is claims about automation are frequently also claims about kinds of people. Um, a prerequisite to automating human labor is treating that labor as if it's mechanical work rather than skilled work. Thus, in order to understand what it means to automate psychiatric assessment, we have to understand how the organizational hierarchy within the teams conceptualizes the skills and the work associated with psychiatric assessment, especially psychiatric listening, as mechanical labor. The, the ethnographic examples that I'm going to be talking about next um, are drawn from field work that I conducted over the span of 12 months um, with these three uh, interconnected, interdisciplinary research teams based at three different universities. I spent um, four months at each of the teams working as a research assistant. And for the, for the purpose of time, I'll be focusing on the West Coast and the Midwestern site, although I'm happy to answer questions about the East Coast site um, in the Q&A. Um, and as you can see, each of the teams focuses on a different diagnostic category, and they're also trying to build slightly different kinds of technological prototypes. Um, in the Midwest, they're working on, or no, no, in the West Coast, they're working on the VHI, and in the Midwest, they're trying to build um, a predictive cell phone application that can predict when a bipolar person will have mood episodes based on um, changes of the sounds of their voice. Um, the teams also have very different methods for gathering the data from the research subject, um, for classifying the data, and then for assembling um, the algorithms that make their systems possible. Um, what do I mean by this? So algorithms, um, we hear a lot about algorithms these days. They're good, they're bad, they're evil, they're not so bad. Um, but as I've alluded to earlier, algorithms are essentially just systems of pattern recognition. They're mathematical processes, and what's being calculated is the statistical resemblance between some known thing in a data set and some new item. Um, so, for instance, as I said, at um, the Midwestern site, they're trying to predict when a bipolar person will have either a manic or depressive episode based on changes in their speech. So this means at some point, you have to define what manic and depressive speech sounds like. You have to be able to hold it steady and say, okay, this is what the real thing is, in order to be able to calculate the resemblance between um, this real thing and then some new thing. Um, in order to come up 
with this definition of what manic or depressive speech sounds like, you need people listening to excerpt of speech and then manually adding labels to those excerpts. And then you need to make sure that the labelers all agree with each other's labels. This is um, very tedious, tiring work, and it's also very subjective. And the three teams across the three universities really disagreed with each other's methods for coming up with labels and for how to define um, pathological speech. Um, but aside from these differences, the teams are actually quite similar to each other. Um, they're, they're demographically similar. They work with um, demographically similar research subjects, and they also have a similar organizational structure. So at the top, you have the, the PIs, the primary investigators, and usually there's a, um, an engineering PI, and then a psychiatry or a psychology PI. And then underneath the PIs are the postdocs who play more of a supervising role, and they delegate tasks to people below them, so grad students, undergrads, and then research assistants like me. Finally, there are the staff members who are employees of the university, and they play a, a more administrative role. They, they do a lot of administrative support to the teams. Um, engineering team members tended to be male and higher up in the hierarchy, so lots of male um, PIs and postdocs and PhDs. And then psychology and psychiatry team members tended to be women and also lower in the hierarchy, so research assistants and then people who are staff rather than um, students. Um, team members on the psych side of things, they were also the people who tended to interact directly with research subjects the most. Um, so my field work, um, it combined interviews with participant observations, and I assisted with activities that spanned really the whole research and development pipeline. So this included things like assisting with studies, but then also um, attending like weekly meetings and presenting at them, um, attending journal clubs and courses and conferences and workshops alongside my informants. Um, as I've alluded to, being a research assistant is a pretty low-ranking position, and because I don't have any training in either the engineering side or the psych side of things, um, a lot of the things that I ended up doing were things that higher-ranking team members um, didn't have the time to do but needed to get done. So labeling lots of data, um, serving as a pilot research subject, um, or also, this was kind of fun, co-writing a script and then starring in a video that we created for an experiment. Um, so my position as a novice working alongside other less experienced researchers and staff allowed me to get a better understanding of the nature of the tasks that were considered unskilled, um, busy work, things that anybody could do because I could do them. <laughs> um, since I've already started talking a little bit about the, the Midwestern site, I'm going to stay there for a little. Um, so as I mentioned, at Midwestern University, uh, the team was trying to build a cell phone application with people who are um, diagnosed with bipolar disorder that can project either a manic or depressive episode. And mania and depression are the two, the two poles of bipolar, and mania is associated with intense, uninhibited euphoria, and then depression with paralyzing, very debilitating sadness. The psychiatry PI of this study was inspired to build this app by the friends and family of his patients. Um, his patients' loved ones would tell him, you know, I just had a feeling that they were going to have an episode because something had just sounded off about them. The PI wanted to create an application that could capture and distill this ineffable something that the patient's friends and families heard. Um, so in other words, the, um, the point of their study, as he put it, was to train a computer to listen like a brain. This is something that he said often. Train a computer to listen like a brain. Um, the, the data for the predictive cell phone app came in the form of audio recorded phone calls of research subjects' speech. To participate in the study, research subjects were given um, a cell phone that the engineering team had installed special software on. The software recorded all of the outgoing calls that the research subjects um, made, although it only recorded the research subjects' ends of the conversation, so you couldn't hear who they were talking to. Um, in addition to just using the phone as they normally would, to participate in the study once a week, the research subjects had to call up um, someone on the psychology team and undergo a psychiatric assessment to determine their symptoms of either mania, mania or depression for that week. 
And these recorded phone calls were then spliced up into short segments, and then me and two undergrad researchers would listen to them and label the data. So this is what it looks like to, to label the data. We would listen to like three to 30 second long excerpts of the, the phone calls, and then we would add two numerical values on a scale from one to nine. So first, a value for the, the activation of speech, how calm or energized does this speech sound? And then another label also on one to nine um, for the valence. So does the speech sound negative or does it sound positive? Um, and when we did this work, we were told only assign a rating to the way that the speech sounds, just try to ignore the, the content altogether. Um, and in the span of the four months that I was there, these two undergrads and I, we produced um, like 9,900 labels. So it was a, a lot of labels, but this was just to test how well we agreed with each other. It was like two steps below from actually building the app. So as I said, this is a, a very labor intensive process. Um, so training a computer to listen like a brain for the, for the PI, meant capturing the auditory equivalent of a gut instinct. He meant listen like anyone, like any human would. However, the engineering team members responsible for this work came to find that we didn't necessarily listen with our guts or with our brains alone. Instead, our listening was culturally mediated. The, the intuition we used was based on our experiences as people who speak English as their first language. The postdocs on the engineering team, they didn't speak English as their first language. Um, and so they said, you know, we can't label this data. And they would tell me, like, I can listen to it, but I just can't hear it. Um, in the same way that if I'm talking to my family in my first language, uh, you might think that I sound angry based on how my speech sounds to you. As one engineering postdoc put it then, we weren't training a computer to listen like a brain. We were training a computer in American culture uh, or in uh, very culturally specific ways of expressing emotion. But we weren't the only ones um, labeling the phone calls. The all-female staff on the psychology team also labeled data, and their labels came in the form of the assessments that they made um, of the subject's level of manic or depressive symptoms during the weekly phone call. During the assessment calls, the psychology staff um, would ask the subject a series of questions based on um, two gold standard assessment scales, the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, and then the Young Mania Rating Scale. And based on the subject's answers to these questions, the psychology team person, um, the staff member, or the, the team member, would assign two numerical scores to the call, quantifying how manic or how depressed the subject was that week. And these numerical scores were crucial to the overall study because they determined which of the calls the engineering team members would eventually label. Subjects had to experience at least two symptomatic calls during their year-long participation for their audio data to even ever make it to the engineering team. So the clinical team was responsible for determining what even got to count as data in the first place, determining which calls were bipolar enough. Um, but determining assessment scores based on a phone call alone, alone, it's not easy. It's actually a very difficult task. Um, and there were one or two very experienced team members who would sometimes train um, the younger, less experienced team and staff in using the assessment scales and in techniques for encouraging the subjects to divulge personal information over the phone to someone that they had never met because the assessments required the subjects to talk about extremely personal things like their bowel movements and their libido and also thoughts of self-harm. The goal was to get the subject talking so that the researcher had enough information to make a score. But they also had to get the subjects talking for the sake of the engineers. If the subjects gave really short or curt yes or no answers to the questions, that would mean that there wasn't enough audio for the engineering team to judge, and that portion of the call would just be discarded from the data set. So when I wasn't working with the engineering team, I was shadowing members of the psychology team, sitting next to them at their desks as they made their assessment calls, and then discussing their scoring decisions with them. I came to find that younger, less experienced team members, which was the majority of the team, had a very recipe-like approach for conducting the phone calls, and the calls ended very quickly. 
they, they tended to rely heavily on an interview guide, the standardized interview guide, um, and they would ask questions verbatim as they appeared on the guide, and then they'd wait for the subject's answer, and then they'd directly move on to the next question. So it was a very kind of generic interaction week after week. On the other hand, the few team members with more clinical experience would jump around the guide, and the calls would last for much longer. They wouldn't necessarily ask for information either. They would work with the subject to craft a narrative about how the past week had gone that just so happened to contain the information that they needed, and then the scale would kind of melt away. Um, a lot of the tactics that I observed them using connected to the language ideology that I described earlier on in the talk, um, the one that's conventional to U.S. mental health care. In a very strategic way, these more senior women would treat speech as if it was tied to the subject's self rather than tied to data or information that they, would, they were looking for. And they would carefully tweak the impression of what they were looking for. Um, Adele, who worked for years as a social worker before joining the team, explained to me that the best way to get subjects to give information that you needed was to continually, quote, give a little bit of yourself. So give the impression that the conversation was about getting to know each other, about a very symmetrical sharing of selves, rather than um, the extraction of data. So if conducting psychiatric assessment, um, getting people to share this extremely personal information, if it's so complex, if it's such skilled work that requires a lot of training and practice and a lot of tacit knowledge to do well, then why is this the kind of thing that my informants are trying to automate? To walk through an answer, um, I'm going to bring us back to the West Coast University and to the virtual human interviewer system. Months after um, my initial meeting with Klaus, I found myself in a very different kind of demonstration. I was working alongside Hillary, a researcher on the psychology team, at a public exhibition on human-robot interactions helping to showcase a humanoid robot that the, that the psychology team was trying to use in a new study involving the VHI. The point of this showcase was to attract potential research subjects. So we had to make the android look nice, and we bought it new clothes and fixed its hair. Although notice in this image, it's, it's Hillary and I fixing the hair, and then the two male engineers are um, fixing the computers, setting up the computers. Um, Hillary and I were, were responsible for running the exhibition and creating this setup that was supposed to simulate what it would be like to participate in the study. So we sat the android um, behind our table, and then we put another chair in front of the table um, for people to sit in. And then we had to explain the study. The, the point of the study was to compare subjects' experiences of being interviewed by Abby, the usual user interface, with being interviewed by the android. So it's the same exact setup as the, the Abby setup, except you have a different body. Instead of this character on a screen, you have this embodied form, the, the robot. Um, and the psychology team, why they were doing this experiment because they wanted to know if interacting face-to-face -face with this embodied human-like um, form, as opposed to a character on a screen, would somehow impact people's feelings of trust or rapport. Um, both Abby and the android, they're designed to have very similarly gendered bodies. They're both supposed to look like women. Uh, researchers on the psychology team told me that they decided to make Abby a woman because they wanted to ensure that subjects felt like they were being listened to by a non-aggressive and a warm and a non-judgmental agent. Um, <laughs> they wanted subjects to clearly understand that Abby was not human, but also find Abby to be human enough, to be familiar enough, that they would still engage with the system socially. Yet, the experiment with the android had a significant variable that Hillary and I tried to avoid bringing up during the showcase. The android was designed to resemble a Japanese woman, and Abby was not. Some of my informants said that Abby was racio-ethnically ambiguous by design because this allowed research subjects to project their own identity onto her and feel more close to her as a result. However, other informants told me that she was in fact fashioned after Google images of Latina social worker. <laughs> if you, if, and in fact, if you, look, if you look at the programming code for Abby, you can see that at some point someone gave her a Latina last name. It's, it's literally in her code. 
Um, apparently, one of the psychology PIs had wanted her to look like someone who might work at the local VA, since this is the kind of mental health care professional that research subjects and the intervention's target population, the veterans, were most likely to interact with and therefore most familiar with. If the gendering of Abby signals ex expectations about women as good, passive, understanding listeners, then the racing of Abby signals expectations about what kind of woman is most likely to fill this passive listening role in an administrative mental health context. There were an onslaught of people in the, in the exhibition hall, and Hillary and I spent roughly three hours fielding their questions. Uh, people would, would wave their hands in front of the android's eye and ask, can she hear me? Can she see me? <laughs> Or they would just ignore Hillary and I altogether and would sit down in the chair and then try to answer the interview questions that played from the speaker on the windowsill behind the android. Hillary and I would take turns answering the questions, no, the android can't see or hear, there are no microphones and no camera hooked up to it. Um, and even if there were, since we don't have VirtuSense, the software running through the android, there's no way for the audio or the visual input to be processed. But the most difficult and common question, question came from people who found this whole setup deeply alarming. Um, these people accused Hillary and I of trying to build a robot therapist or replace humans, and they would conjure up a dystopian future where robots are the stewards of our mental health. Hillary would take the reins in dealing with this, um, this accusation because she dealt with it often whenever giving public tours of the research facilities. She would explain that the system was still in development and not ready for um, actual clinical use anytime soon. And most of all, she would emphasize that the point of the VHI was to conduct assessment. The system was very limited. It was, at most, a tool for sorting patients, for doing triage, for figuring out which people were in need of professional human care. She would firmly explain the VHI was not meant to be a replacement for therapy. It couldn't provide therapy. It couldn't even make a diagnosis. Only a licensed, trained, professional human could diagnose or treat another human. And in fact, the, the first thing that the, interfa the interface was designed to say at the start of the interview was, I'm not a therapist. Keep in mind as well that Abby is not a therapist because she was designed to look like a Latino social worker. <laughs> and social workers are not necessarily therapists. There's a hierarchy of value that maps onto the professional distinction between these two jobs and the socio-cultural capital that separates them. The time set aside for extensive secondary schooling, the money for frequent and expensive licensing and credentialing exams, and so on. This distinction gets articulated in the kinds of work that social workers versus therapists are licensed to do. A therapist can officially diagnose you and treat you, a social worker which research subjects were more likely to interact with in a very public health and resource low context like the VA, they're more likely to simply assess you. It's telling then that people's anxieties and disgust upon witnessing the VHI revolved around the automation of therapy, and Hillary's alibi that they were only trying to automate assessment seemed to put people at ease. It speaks to the value associated with the skills necessary to conduct psychiatric assessment and the people likely to be conducting assessment in places like the VA, Latina social workers, like Abby. Taylor, um, one of the young women who was working behind the scenes and monitoring people's interactions with the VHI, explained the VHI and the difference between assessment and diagnosis to me in this way. She said, when you go to the doctor, you're going to first see a nurse, and she's going to draw your blood and get all your baselines. So the, the VHI assessment is kind of your objective measures. It's getting your tone of voice, your measurements, and it's giving a kind of numerical output, which would then tell a doctor, based on this interactions, they're showing all different signs of X, Y, and Z, and, you know, may indicate that there might maybe showing signs of PTSD or depression, and then, you know, an actual human can make a diagnosis. In Taylor's explanation, Abby is like a nurse, who Taylor unquestionably genders, um, drawing blood and providing initial indicators of how a patient is doing before an actual human doctor can step in and make an actually medical call. But Taylor's analogy doesn't quite map as neatly as she might have intended. A nurse, an actual human, 
draws a patient's blood, but Abby, the virtual human, supported by Taylor and her colleagues, a pair of invisible actual humans, draws out a patient's psychiatric vitals. Taylor seems to suggest that the nurse's embodied presence holding the needle is unnecessary. To make Taylor's analogy work, that Abby is like a nurse drawing blood, you have to treat the needle, the nurse, and the analysis of blood as one thing. It's like saying that an assessment tool psychiatrically assesses someone, when in fact, as we saw, someone like Adele conducts psychiatric assessment, ideally in a way that makes the tool itself, the assessment scale, disappear. Taylor's explanation also downplays her and her colleagues' own emotionally difficult work. Interactions with the VHI are not like a blood test, because drawing up and listening to the research subject's deeply personal stories is a charged process that can be traumatic for listeners and can be re-traumatizing for speakers. The, the debriefing period was often quite upsetting for Taylor and her colleague for this reason, especially since they couldn't let on that they had been listening. This would have broken the experimental paradigm of Abby's non-humanness. So, by way of um, wrapping up and offering some concluding thoughts, I turn to um, feminist and post-colonial science and technology studies scholarship that recenters into analytic view the materially grounded labor practices that make high-tech and flashy and innovative technologies possible, like computer chips and cell phones. For instance, scholars like Donna Haraway and Lisa Nakamura emphasize that the manual labor of women, especially women of color, has largely fueled and yet remains marginal to the massive manufacturing enterprise that enables tech giants of Silicon Valley. To keep this marginalized labor in mind is to keep in mind that digital technologies are always the outcome of digital work, meaning, as Nakamura puts it, the work of the hand and its digits. And also to keep in mind that computa computation is made possible not only through software, but through the alignment of wetware and fleshware. These interventions are especially crucial when it comes to digital media technologies, precisely because these technologies might otherwise seem so immaterial, with the immediacy of the connections they enable, and with their codes and their clouds and their screens, that um, mediate away and make less available for scrutiny the bodies and the work that went into producing them. I think again about um, how Klaus's demonstration of the VHI software didn't include Taylor and the other young women. This is a very strict definition of software. Drawing attention to the otherwise marginal digital labor and the fleshware of software dissolves what Ostra Taylor calls, quote, the ideology of automation in its attendant myth of human obsolescence, quote. In this way, automation represents a replacement of humans insofar as we think of it as a replacement, the placing or situating of humans elsewhere in the production pipeline to a less visible spot where work no longer counts as work. As scholars like Marie Hicks, Jennifer Light, uh, Joy Rankin, and Lucy Suchman have highlighted, the history of computing, especially in the US and the UK, is precisely the history of minimizing, if not altogether erasing, the role that women played. And this is especially the case for women of color. Uh, Hicks, in particular, points out that being a computer, manually doing the mathematical processes necessary for computing, didn't become feminized because women did this work. Rather, women were in a structural position due to heteropatriarchal norms that made them more available to do certain kinds of jobs, and then the jobs became feminized as women's work. The same is true with no nursing or with social work. Adele was not inherently good at drawing out people's personal stories because she is a woman, and all the Latina social workers that Abby is based off of are not social workers because they're inherently good at it. It has more to do with being in a position due to structural forces, structural inequalities, to take up jobs that are, that are grueling, that are tiring, that require emotional labor, and that aren't very well paid. It's a question of who can offer up labor that is disposable, and then gender and race become resources for naturalizing people's positions in those jobs. When we search for the, the digital labor that undergrids the technologies my informants build, we find linguistic labor, 
the work of giving the impression that you were listening empathically and carefully, or the work of strategically encouraging the sharing of personal details, or the work of listening for suicidal ideation. It's precisely the elision of this labor that enables the illusion of machine autonomy, that makes heteromation look like automation, and that allows the notion of machine listening to make sense as a mode of listening that is distinct and superior to and set apart from human listening. But as I've argued, um, in practice, in actually making machines listen, we watch the division between human and machine waver and break down and we see instead humans being treated like they are machines. In this way, the dream of an autonomous android that does the bidding of humans or a machine that flattens speech into a signal is a dream in the classic Freudian sense, a desired but unfulfilled wish. Thank you. <laughs>